Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about our favorite underwater mammal, the dolphin. My guest today is Diane Alps. Ms. Alps is an adjunct research scientist with the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Welcome, Diane, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Hi, Dave. Thank you very much for having me. Well, as we talk about dolphins, uh, people probably don't realize how many types of dolphins there are, but it's a pretty large family. So why don't we start by discussing the range and the sort of scale and scope of types of dolphins there are, and also how do we define what a dolphin is? Sure. Dolphins actually belong to a larger group of animals um, call, uh, that we commonly refer to as whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Scientifically, they're classed in an order called cetaceans. Um, they're all the whales, dolphins, and porpoises in the world, the marine mammals that are adapted to living in, in the ocean. There are 90 cetaceans in the world, and uh, they're typically broken into two classes of toothed whales and baleen whales. So our filter feeding large whales that we think of, those humpback whales, blue whales, um, are the, considered the baleen whales. And then dolphins are part of those toothed whales. So it's a classification of 10 different families of animals, all ranging very, very differently. Um, and they're, they have different natural history, different habitats, different feeding um, that I'm really excited to, to share with you and talk about. In, in terms of the scope and so forth of the dolphin family, the specific dolphin family, we know that we have the bottlenose dolphin, which most people are familiar with from the television program Flipper, but we also have the orca killer whales as well in that same family. Yet the porpoises are not in that specific family, and why is that? Yes, well, the family Delphinidae, the actual family of dolphins, include 37 species, and they are very wide-ranging, as you mentioned, all the way from the largest, which is the killer whale, which many people don't believe or recognize is an actual dolphin, all the way down to some of the smaller ones, such as our common dolphins that we see off of our coastline. Within the toothed whales, as I mentioned, there are 10 different families of animals. Those are uh, different based on genealogy and morphology. And so our dolphins and porpoises are very different based on morphological features and some of the genealogy. There are seven different species of porpoises, one that can be actually seen here in our waters in, um, in cold water years. We have some variations. Um, but we do have, as I mentioned, 39 species, uh, I'm sorry, 37 species of dolphins in this family of dolphins. And some of the differences include their, uh, their shape, their general shape. Dolphins, as we recognize from our um, uh, bottlenose, it's a very classic dolphin. It's got a very pointy beak that sticks out. It's got a, a um, the do dorsal fin is curved slightly in falcate, which means it has a, about a, a hook shape. And it's a, you know, typically a long lean animal. And porpoises are a little bit more robust, kind of chunkier in a sense. They also have no beak. They actually have a bit more of just a, a cone shape themselves with no beak or just a point to their uh, front area where their mouth is. And their dorsal fins are very triangular, so they don't have that hook on the outside. And uh, another very interesting character is that dolphins' teeth are cone-shaped, a little bit pointier, and the porpoises, their teeth are a little bit more squared off or spade-shaped. Those are the areas that are very easy to diagnose when you're looking at the differences between dolphins and porpoises. And we also have what are called river dolphins. Of course, that doesn't really apply here, but in other parts of the world, we have river dolphins. The 37 types of dolphins you mentioned are what we call oceanic dolphins, yes. but there are about roughly five river dolphins. What's the difference? The river dolphins are also very specialized for living in their environment. They have very small eyes because they don't uh, use their eyes to see. They have very, very long bills, and typically that's for moving through murky mud. Um, and they also don't have fused vertebrae in their neck. It gives them the ability to turn their neck very uh, quickly and abruptly in um, these narrow channels that they may be swimming in. Uh, belugas, which are another toothed whale that are found up in the uh, higher latitudes in the Arctic Oceans, also don't have fused vertebrae in their neck, giving them that ability to turn their head back and forth, much like we do. But typical dolphins are oceanic dolphins. They're fused, and they don't have the ability to move their head in that way. 
How many different types of oceanic dolphins are commonly seen around the California coast? And do they intermingle the different breeds? And do they occasionally interbreed? We get, we have five very regularly seen types of dolphins in our area, including two species of common dolphins. Very hard to distinguish between the two, one called a long beak common dolphin, one called a short beak common dolphin. We also get Pacific white-sided dolphin, a beautiful black and white animal. We um, regularly see Riso's dolphin, a very, very large animal. Um, and then we have the bottlenose dolphin. We have a coastal variation that you see can you can see riding in the surf. Um, surfers often ri uh, report them, you know, interacting with them and, and uh, being nearby while they're out surfing. And then we also have an offshore variety that are seen out by the islands. Um, so those dolphins are the most common, the common, the two types of common dolphins, specific white side, risos and bottlenose. There's another handful of dolphins that we see offshore um, or in um, ex ex special circumstances. We call them rare or kind of our exotic visitors, including killer whales, um, uh, pilot whales, false killer whales is another species. And we get these a couple of times a year. Uh, but then there's species offshore that we don't really see in coastal, but they're considered part of our Southern California waters. What about the intermingling and the interbreeding? Does that happen? Well, not too much interbreeding. Um, that typically leads to hybridization, which then is not an animal that can continue and reproduce. Uh, we see, um, we do see some intermixing. Um, every now and then we'll see bottlenose dolphin intermixing with Riso's dolphin. Um, but they are likely fishing, going after the same prey, perhaps, and that might be why they're intermixing. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the fact that, of course, dolphins are mammals. Yes. Uh, what are the common characteristics of mammals, even for those that are underwater? Right, it's hard to believe they're just like we are. They're mammals, so they're, they are warm-blooded, which means they are thermoregulating. They uh, have hair, actually, and believe it or not, and that's always a surprising one, that they do have hair, but they have uh, small hair. Um, oftentimes in dolphins, it's uh, reabsorbed before they're born, but in larger whales, they also have hair follicles, and it's uh, believed to detect, um, help detect the, the calf to detect mom when in the nursing when they're very close proximity. Uh, they breathe air, and that's when we get to see them. They spend a very little portion of their life coming up to the surface, but that's our benefit is when they come up to the air uh, to take a breath or come up to the surface to take a breath. They also nurse their young. Oh, well, they give live birth, um, so they don't lay eggs of any sort. That wouldn't be very practical in the ocean, but just like mammals, they do give live birth, and the mothers will nurse their young. Mm -hmm. And as far as the uh, bottlenose dolphin is concerned, that's the one that we see on the television show Flipper, and that's the one that most people are familiar with. Is there anything particularly special about the bottlenose dolphin? Is it any different or any more capable than any other dolphins that we know of? That's a good question, and I'm a little biased. I really love bottlenose dolphins. They're some of my favorites, and in many cases, uh, many people's favorites, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that they're um, frequently seen. Uh, as you mentioned, the TV show Flipper, people, uh, e even young people now are seeing the TV show Flipper and, um, and movies similar to that featuring uh, bottlenose dolphins. So um, they come in close to shore, which makes them a little more accessible as well, uh, and they are our common, they're the iconic dolphins. They have all the features and representations that we think of when we think of a dolphin. They're worldwide, so um, eventually with genetics and, uh, you know, they're, they're very well might be split into many different species, but um, worldwide there are dolphins in most coastal areas, and I think that's another reason why um, people are so familiar with them. They, they kind of exist all over the place. We know that dolphins have this amazing ability to do acrobatic spins. They jump out of the water, they spin in, in the air, uh, they surf, you mentioned that already. Uh, they do what's called bow surfing. When a ship comes by and creates a bow wave, they'll body surf on the bow wave. They have these amazing physical capabilities. Is that necessary for them to um, develop these capabilities? Is there a, um, a scientific imperative uh, for them to act in this way or is it just fun for them? Yeah, it's a good question. These animals make a living in the ocean environment, so they have to stay very fit. And uh, so much like us, that we, re we require exercise, so do they. So um, in order to maintain their abilities to breathe deep, uh, breathe and hold their breath for a long time, for example, they have to exercise their lungs. A lot of that would come from their, uh, you, you know, continuing their aerobic fitness, in exa for example. So some of this very well may be just their body's physiological demands requiring 
training them to maintain that active and fitness level. It varies by species. It's very interesting. Some are much more dynamic than others. Some have uh, much more leaping and surface behaviors than others. Some will be a little bit more um, calm and reserved, but they all do to some extent have to perform some of these uh, aerobic activities. Bow riding is a hard one though. Bow riding is when, as you mentioned, they ride on the bow of a ship and I've seen them come from quite the distance when they hear a boat in the area, move towards that boat and then just come in front of it and ride along with it. And it is, uh, you know, as a form of exercise probably in like body surfing is for us, but they seem to get a little bit of joy out of it too. So I don't know if they're having some fun. We should be having fun when we exercise as well, right? <laughs> should be. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, let, let's take a look at some slides now that show us uh, what people are familiar with, with the orca killer whales. And there you see a show where um, an orca killer whale is jumping out of the water. If we go to the next slide, we can see two of them. They're usually paired together in these uh, shows. In the next slide, we can see that uh, they're jumping together simultaneously, and so they have a tremendous amount of power. Diane, I understand that uh, an orca killer whale can weigh as much as 11 tons and can be as long as 30 feet long, is that correct? Yes, the largest of our dolphin family are the killer whales and they can be lar quite large up to, like you said, about 30 feet. Okay, if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, this is SeaWorld and we won't be seeing too many shows like this in the future. I know there's been a lot of objection to uh, keeping uh, orca killer whales in captivity, um, but let's go to the next slide and take a look at what the uh, killer whales look like uh, paired together in the next slide, please. And there they are swimming together. Uh, if we go to the next one, we then see the mouth and the teeth. Interestingly enough, we talked about how dolphins, uh, I think we talked about this, maybe it was before the show, but sometimes it seems like dolphins smile at us because of the way the mouth is formed, but there's no real evidence to suggest they're smiling, that's just the way they were designed. And they also have teeth in that case, but they don't use the teeth for, um, chewing, what do they use those teeth for? Yes, yeah, so touching on the dolphin smiling issue is very interesting. It, uh, it seems to be something that attracts people. They feel like dolphins have this smile, this upturned mouth, but it is really the shape of the mouth. They don't have muscles there that move the mouth up and down like ours does. These, this is just their natural design. It makes them look a little bit friendly. And some say they also look like they're holding their flippers out for a hug because of the shape and you know placement of their flippers. But this is just their natural, natural shape and design to make them very effective and efficient in the water. Um, their teeth are used just for for grabbing their food. Um, and in the case of um, all toothed whales, it's for grabbing their food and then they ingest it typically whole. In the case of some specialized killer whales that eat marine mammals, they will cooperatively uh, each grab a portion of the, of the prey and tear it apart, or in some cases just shake their head viciously, which rips off bite-sized portions because some of the prey that they're hunting is very, very large and they're not able to swallow it whole. But that's an exception for killer whales and uh, an animal called false killer whales. Most dolphins and most tooth whales just grab those, grab their prey and then swallow it down. So those teeth aren't used in the same way as ours are. And on that note, we're gonna have to go to the break. And when we come back from the break, we'll talk about dolphins and a mysterious uh, capability known as echolocation. And also, what about the intelligence of dolphins? How do they exhibit that intelligence in the wild? Stay tuned. Ever thought about studying the psychological ecology of sharks using robots? Or maybe spending the day not in a classroom, but aboard a large vessel studying marine life in the ocean firsthand? The opportunities are endless with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Diane Alps. Diane, before we went to the break, we looked at that series of slides about the orca killer whales and the various killer whale shows. There's been a lot of controversy over the past few years about keeping orca whales um, in captivity and, and forcing them to perform in shows. A number of documentaries and other protest movements have occurred. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, is it not a good thing to keep uh, killer whales in captivity? And why is it not, a, not, why is it not necessarily a good thing? 
And on the other side of the coin, has there been some benefit in terms of research that has occurred because of having them in captivity? Sure, it's a great question and uh, a great topic. As you mentioned, it's very controversial as well. There, uh, killer whales in the wild travel great distances a daily, up 75 to 125 miles. So it's a quite a long-ranging animal. There's a lot of stimulation that is um, that it acquires while it's out in the wild. The fishes, the predators, and the prey that it's dealing with, and just the general exercise and mobility. So there has been um, a lot of discussion whether or not killer whales thrive in the, these captive environments. So um, we are moving away from that at this point. Uh, there are still many cetaceans in captivity, including dolphins, uh, the smaller dolphins like bottlenose dolphins, that don't seem to have quite the same health challenges um, as these larger killer whales. We have learned a great deal uh, having these animals in captivity, and a lot of that has been applied now to rescue and, and rehabilitation efforts. We know a lot about the health of animals because of the studies and the time that has been devoted while these animals were in captivity, while we were learning and keeping them healthy. And so now when we have a sick animal on the beach, for example, or um, it comes up in other, some other issues, we're able to take those in and apply some of those skills and methods to be able to rehabilitate and then release the animal. Let's talk about also the so-called dolphin safe fishing practices that have been uh, developed and implemented over the last uh, number of years. Are we getting as much dolphin safety out of these new fishing practices as we've been told through these marketing campaigns? I think we've come a long way from the 70s and even uh, into the 80s, the fisheries at the time. Out in the eastern tropical Pacific, large purse seiners would look for dolphins um, because the dolphins would associate with large tuna that were all feeding on a small on small fishes. And they would set their nets around those large um, pods of dolphins. And oftentimes those dolphins were uh, considered bycatch and didn't survive that in that encirclement and now we have dolphin safe tuna labels which, which requires a very very low number if any mortality whatsoever in the dolphin safe entrapment there's still a lot of stress that's put on these animals um, because they're in, still circled on them they're just released there's still some stressors and we don't know a lot of the long-term impacts that stress has we've studied it in humans and we do know that there are very very many negative impacts long term with repeated stresses. You also risk separating cow-calf pairs if they are encircled in nets and that's something to um, be a concern as well. So some of these tuna methods are much much better and uh, we can always do a little bit better to improve. So some improvement but maybe it's not as good as we would like it to be. It's not perfect. Okay. It's not perfect. <laughs> All right what other hazards do humans pose to dolphins in the wild other than the fishing nets? Well, unfortunately, we, in all, in all of our great ways, we do import a lot of hazards into the ocean in general. A lot of it has to do with pollutions, both in f visual things that you can see, plastics, um, nets. Uh, there's a lot of nets and a lot of bycatch. Bycatch is the number one threat to cetaceans in the world. One estimate takes us from uh, to from two to three hundred thousand animals are killed by entanglement of some sort in the world. So that's a very, very, very large number um, for where we are in this day and age. So that needs to come down a lot. Um, but other plastics getting into the ocean, even if it's not uh, something that can entangle an animal, it still leaves a lot of harm. As it breaks down, it turns into microplastics that are being ingested by these animals. And just like humans, we shouldn't be ingesting plastic. It has long-term impacts. It can also infect in, uh, impact the, the dolphins. So there, you know, the, the definite runoff or um, pollution of, of tangible items such as plastics is, is a major threat. But the intangible ones, the ones that we are, well, not intangible, but the ones we don't see, the less visible things, the runoff of toxins, um, including things like fertilizers, can really impact um, the wildlife in the ocean as well. For example, if, you're, if we wash too much fertilizer into the ocean, it can create 
very, very large blooms of some naturally occurring algaes that then become actually toxic. Um, so we watch for these harmful algal blooms. There's um, actually at USC and UCLA, there's harmful algal bloom watches where they test the waters to keep an eye on and keep track of these. But oftentimes, some of our marine mammals are our first indicators that we've had a bloom because they'll start to come in sick before we've even a been able to detect it. So A little bit later in the show, I'm going to ask you about the frontiers of dolphin yes. research, and so we'll get to that in a moment. But yes. first, I want to talk about the items that I mentioned going into the break. One of those is echolocation, and uh, it's something that actually oceanographer Jacques Cousteau wrote about uh, briefly in his book called uh, The Silent World, which was published in 1953. And basically, echolocation involves, uh, the term is pretty appropriate because it's an echo effect of a, of a sound signal that's sent out and then based on the rebound of that sound you can get a sense of how far that location is away from you, the target location. Uh, I didn't describe it very well but maybe you can do a better job. What is echolocation? Why do dolphins have it and how do they use it? Yes and you did a very good uh, description of it Dave. Um, so echolocation is, um, occurs in all toothed whales. So from the largest, the sperm whale, all the way down to the smallest such as the vaquita through all the families of, um, of toothed whales that I mentioned before. So including dolphins and it is a refined type of biosonar just like bats have um, terrestrially, uh, we also have this underwater biosonar. And so in the case of, of dolphins, they have a specially modified air passageway up in their skull where they, much like a balloon, when you pinch a balloon shut and then let out little bits of air, it creates little sounds, chirps and buzzes. Well, in that same way, they are able with muscles to create buzzes coming out of their air passageways. And through that, then they emit the sound. And once that sound vibrates off of, um, off of something in the, in the ocean, they can pick up those sound vibrations in the fatty hollow lower, or the hollow lower jaws that are filled with a specialized fat. That takes it up into their brain where they can process that into a visual picture. And it is the same way our brain translates things that we see because of the light that's emitted. We just don't emit our own light. <laughs> so they're actually creating their own abilities to be able to see very well. These are not the same buzzes that are used for communication within their pod, but it is what they use for hunting and for locating uh, prey as well as predators. And it also can be used for navigation. So they'll be able to um, detect substrate features. And the interesting part about this, from what I understand, is that dolphins actually have very good vision uh, when they're above water, and then when they go below water, they can see pretty well until it gets cloudier and darker and deeper and so on. And so this is a way for them to see underwater? Exactly. So as, as any good diver will tell you that on a really good day in Southern California, visibility know 30 feet 40 feet so it's not very far and when you're talking about animals that are moving quite rapidly or have large prey or predators that might be after them they need to be able to see um, much better than that and I say see <laughs> much better than that and that's where the echolocation comes into play they don't have the benefit of being able to see for long distances it's not much different than us being in a very foggy area and feeling very blinded by that Right, and I guess for the scientifically minded, this is actually kind of the Doppler effect that we see with bats, the same kind of exactly. um, phenomenon, I exactly, guess. Exactly, exactly, able to detect things in their environment. Well, let's talk about intelligence with dolphins. We always hear that dolphins are very intelligent creatures. Um, and so how do they exhibit this intelligence? How do they utilize it in the wild? Sure, the intelligence is an interesting um, and measurable um, uh, sense and we do know that killer whales especially have a much larger frontal lobe um, proportionately in their body and, and, and within their brains than other cetaceans um, and other mammals as a matter of fact which puts them at a very very high intellect. Um, all dolphins do show signs of, of intellect a lot of that has to do with their um, uh, they, they, they show that in ways of staying together. They're very intricate communication systems that they'll use within their pod. They do have um, very tight-knit 
um, uh, grouping. So in the killer whale family, the males will stay with their mother for their internal uh, their entire life. They have a very tight knit matriarchal society, and that is definitely part of their levels of in intellect uh, staying together. But feeding is also one of the areas that we see a lot of um, these typical signs of intellect. We see them use tools, for example, to catch prey. There's a pod of dolphins in Australia that will pick up from the ocean floor a sea sponge, place it right on the tip of their nostrum, rostrum, and then use it as they to protect their, their rostrum as they burrow through the sand so they don't get stung by um, animals that are in there. And they work together to feed. Killer whales in, in the Antarctic will swim in a pod together towards an ice flow, create a wave with their body to wash a seal off of the ice. These are very abstract thinkings, um, and for them to do it together to, be, to the benefit of the pod, not just to the benefit of one individual, are pretty, is pretty advanced thinking. I guess here on the campus we would call that organizational psychology, where yes, they, they yes. know how to organize for the hunt for a the prey. Absolutely. Yep. And there's several, many, many examples of these different feeding type or feeding methods. We do see it in humpback whales as well. They uh, will get together to do something called bubble net feeding, where they're doing organized uh, foraging behaviors together and it's very, very structured. So we do see it in um, uh, some of the uh, baleen whales, but much less frequently. In a lot of the dolphin species, we see this in many different forms. Well, let's talk about the connection to humans because a lot of people have seen the television shows, the uh, movies and so forth, and they believe that there's this close affinity between dolphins and humans. And Hollywood, of course, uh, promotes this, uh, this belief or this myth. Uh, is there anything to that? Is there any reason why dolphins would be more attracted to or more connected to humans than any other species out there? And why are humans connect attracted to dolphins as go. well? Exactly right. Yes, a, a, a lot of the studies indicate, and these are just social studies uh, inquiring with people, why are they so attracted to, to dolphins and whales in general? And it seems to be that they share so many um, characters with us and the fact that they're mammals, air breathing mammals, and humans are naturally drawn to water. So the fact that they're mammals that live in water, we believe has a lot to do with it. Probably their seemingly playful behaviors as well, these large breaches and dynamic behaviors are very attractive and exciting to, to people. So there's a reason for them to be attracted, we, for us to be attracted to them. Why they're attracted to us? Well, in some cases, we're just a source of food. So <laughs> in many areas, sadly, people will, will feed and think it's fun to get fish and, and feed, feed dolphins as a way to attract them closer to their boat or closer to shore. But as we've seen with a lot of wildlife, we really shouldn't interact. There's, there's a, you know, bear, a lot of issues with, with bears and feeding the bears. And there's a reason there's those signs that say don't feed, don't the, feed bears, the bears, right? We're running out of time, unfortunately. Okay. I just have about 30 seconds left. Uh, I said I'd give you an opportunity to talk about the frontiers of research for dolphin research. Where are those frontiers going? Yes, I think that a lot of these, um, keeping track of what is happening in the health of the ocean is going to be really um, uh, signs from watching the marine mammals as their health is hopefully improving or as we're getting these uh, animals that are coming in sick, we can diagnose the health of the ocean through the health of our marine mammals. So we are very connected to them and to our ocean through our marine mammals. Very good, thank you for being here today. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, have a nice day. I'm Dave Kelly.